You're listening to As Read By Me, the podcast where writers read and readers listen. Hi, this is Rich Hosek. Winter can be a wondrous time, unless, of course, you're on the wrong end of a snowball. I hope you enjoy The Snow Bully, as read by me. The snowball hit Ralph's head at just the right angle and in just the perfect spot to knock his glasses from his face and send him tumbling into the snowbank next to the sidewalk outside of the school. Corey Binger laughed, joined by a chorus of his lackeys. Ralph pulled his face out of the snow and got to his knees. He looked at the small crowd of students who had gathered just behind Corey and his crew, but couldn't make out anything but the colorful shapes of their winter coats without his glasses. Have a nice trip? Corey asked, a classic zinger that the bully never seemed to tire of. His entourage provided the obligatory laugh track. The warning bell rang out from the school, signaling that it was getting close to first period. Corey led his gang toward the building, and the other students who had been watching Ralph's humiliation filed past him as he looked about in vain for his missing glasses. Sarah Firestone approached, reached into the snowbank, and pulled out the missing eyewear. She handed them to Ralph. Thanks, Ralph said. He put his glasses on and got to his feet, smiling gratefully. Sarah rolled her eyes. You're such a loser, Ralphie, she said, then turned her back on him and followed the last of the students into the school. Ralph brushed the snow off his pants, grabbed his backpack, and ran to catch up. It was the last week before Christmas vacation, and today there was a special assembly he didn't want to miss. A ventriloquist was coming to put on a show. Ralph had never seen a real ventriloquist in person. He had seen them on TV, and his grandpa said there used to be one on the radio. That seemed like it would be cheating if you couldn't see him. The assembly wasn't until seventh period, and the days seemed to drag on in slow motion as Ralph sat through all his classes, doodling in his notebook. Finally, the bell rang, signaling it was time to head to the auditorium. Teachers led small herds of students down the hall and filed them into pre-assigned rows. Ralph was lucky. Miss Hamilton's class was in the third and fourth rows. It was unlucky, however, that the class Corey Binger was in was seated right behind him. Fortunately, the teacher knew how to handle the bully, and after his first few attempts to annoy Ralph, Corey was kept at bay. The lights dimmed. The murmur of the students fell to a low whisper as Mr. Weatherton, the principal, walked out onto the stage to address the class. Welcome to the Winter Assembly, he began. I want you all to give a warm Thomas Elva Edison School welcome to Mr. Smith and Grumpy. The curtain opened as Mr. Weatherton departed. A spotlight shone on an empty spot on the left side of the stage. Hey, what are you doing? We're over here! A high-pitched voice shouted from the dark. The spotlight moved to a stool in the middle of the stage, where a tall, thin man wearing one of those flat caps Ralph's grandfather sometimes wore sat. Sitting on his lap was a small clown, dressed in a dingy white clown suit with droopy pom-poms and a frilly collar. He wore bright blue shoes and white gloves. His hair was bright red, his face was white, and he had an outline of a frown painted round his mouth. Grumpy was certainly the perfect name for the ventriloquist's dummy. Why did you bring me to the zoo? Grumpy asked Mr. Smith. We're not at the zoo, Mr. Smith replied. We're at a school. Grumpy peered out at the audience. Are you sure we're not at the monkey house? He asked. The kids laughed. It smells like we're at the monkey house, Grumpy said. Then he turned to Mr. Smith and sniffed his shirt. No, wait, that's you. The kids laughed again. Ralph was impressed. Mr. Smith's lips barely moved whenever Grumpy spoke, and the puppet had a wide range of expressions. Even his eyes moved. The show went on for more than half an hour. Mr. Smith kept on promising Grumpy would sing a Christmas carol, but he never seemed to get around to it until the very end. Then he sang a version of Frosty the Snowman, in which he mangled all the verses to the amusement of the kids. When the show was over, Mr. Weatherton returned to the stage and thanked Mr. Smith and Grumpy. Do you like being a zookeeper? Grumpy asked the principal, and the kids laughed again. Sorry, Mr. Smith said to Mr. Weatherton, and he turned to his dummy. Say goodbye, Grumpy. Grumpy turned to the students and said, Goodbye, Grumpy. Everyone clapped as the curtains closed and the lights came back on. The final bell rang and the auditorium became a free-for-all as the teachers lost all authority over the kids as they ran toward their lockers for freedom. Ralph waited for the main rush to leave before making his own exit. He got his backpack and coat from his locker, then spied Corey and his gang waiting at the main entrance to the school. So instead of going out that way, 
he made his way back to the door that led out to the teacher's parking lot. The teacher's cars were all still there. They usually hung around for a half an hour or so after school ended. At the end of the parking lot was a van, with Mr. Smith and Grumpy painted in big circus letters across its side. Ralph saw Mr. Smith carrying Grumpy out to the van. The tall man opened the side door and set Grumpy inside. Then he climbed in himself. As he did so, the top of the door frame caught the brim of his flat cap, and it fell from Mr. Smith's head onto the pavement of the parking lot. The side door of the van slid shut on a motorized track. Then the vehicle pulled away. Ralph ran over, shouting and waving. Wait, wait, Mr. Smith, you dropped your hat. But Mr. Smith didn't hear him, and the van turned out onto the street and drove away. Ralph picked up the flat cap and turned it over in his hands. It seemed old and was a lot softer than he expected. There weren't any tags or labels on the inside. No phone number Ralph could call to return it to Mr. Smith. So he stepped it in his backpack and shuffled off toward his house. The snow in Ralph's front yard from the previous night's storm was perfect for building a snowman. But he didn't build a snowman the way most kids did. It wasn't just a series of giant snowballs stacked on top of each other. He used smaller pieces to make the snowman's feet, then his legs, the body, and eventually the head. He'd gotten pretty good at it. And with the help of a small stepladder, he was able to craft a pretty decent-looking statue of a man out of snow. Of course, the thing he was most proud of was the pumpkin he had saved from Halloween. It had a scary face painted on it, and Ralph had taken care not to carve it or damage the skin. It was getting soft in parts, but it made for the perfect head for his creation. That's a stupid-looking snowman, Cory Binger shouted from across the street. Ralph turned, just in time to get hit square in the chest by a snowball. He fell onto his butt, then a whole barrage of snowballs, some of them as hard as ice, came his way as Cory and his gang threw a few dozen they had obviously stacked up while Ralph was busy making the snowman. He raised his arms in front of his face and just sat there and allowed the snowballs to hit him as the bullies exhausted their ammo. When they were done, Corey shouted, Your snow blob sucks! His friends provided their obligatory laughter and the group of them thankfully continued on their way. Ralph sighed as he brushed the snow off his pants and scooped out the pieces that had fallen down the back of his neck. He got to his feet and looked up at his snowman. A particularly hard piece of ice had hit the pumpkin creating a crooked gash right where its mouth had been painted on. At first, Ralph was mad, but then he realized it made his creation kind of scary. The late evening sun was shining in a way that made the gooey pumpkin guts inside look like a zombie's rotting flesh. I think I'll call you Abraham, Ralph told the snowman, after Abraham Van Brunt, the headless horseman, Abe for short. Ralph thought back to the ventriloquist show and the finale where Grumpy the Clown sang his twisted version of Frosty the Snowman. How cool would it be if Abe could come to life like Frosty had, if there really was such a thing as a magic hat? Then he remembered the flat cap the ventriloquist had dropped in the teacher's parking lot. He ran over to where he had left his backpack and pulled the old woolen cap from the pocket he had stuffed it in and looked at it. The ventriloquist was kind of a magician, wasn't he? Could it be there was some magic in his cap? That Abe could come to life, play with Ralph, maybe help him get back at those bullies? What do you say, Abe? Ralph asked the lifeless pumpkin-headed snowman. Do you want to help me build a fort? I bet you'd be amazing in a snowball fight. Maybe we could even get even with Cory and his gang. Abe just stared straight ahead, his twisted grin snarling at the setting sun. Ralph considered climbing the stepladder to place the cap atop Abe, but it had gotten knocked down in the barrage, so he just tossed it up like a frisbee, hoping for the best. The flat cap landed perfectly on the pumpkin's head. Its brim pointed straight ahead. Ralph, time for dinner, Ralph's mom shouted from the front door. Coming, Mom, Ralph shouted back. He waited a few seconds, searching for some sign of life in the snowy statue, but he remained frozen in place. Oh, well, Ralph said. You're still a pretty cool snowman, even if you're not alive. He picked up his backpack and ran into the house. A strong breeze knocked the last dry brown leaves from a nearby tree. And Abe's head turned ever so slowly toward the house. The next morning, Ralph ran from the house like a streak. He was going to be late for school if he didn't hurry. He barely had time to notice that there was something different about Abe. Was he in a different spot? Had someone tried to move him? No time to think about it now. Ralph had perfect attendance and no tardy so far this school year, and was determined to keep his streak unblemished. He made it just as the warning bell rang. Standing outside the main door looking for something was Cory Binger's posse. 
Were they waiting for Ralph? Where was Corey? Sneaking up behind him, ready to shove a handful of ice-cold snow down the back of his pants? Ralph turned around, but Corey was nowhere to be seen. He was the last one funneling into the school, and Corey's lackeys paid him no mind. Rumors about Corey spread quickly throughout the day. Someone had heard that he was in the hospital. Another student had information that he was suffering from frostbite, and they were going to have to amputate all his fingers and toes. By lunchtime, the story had filled in somewhat. Someone had thrown a large chunk of ice through Corey's bedroom window in the middle of the night, then had apparently heaped buckets of snow inside as well, burying the boy under an indoor avalanche. What made the story all the more incredible was that Corey's bedroom was on the second story of his family's house. We know it was you who did it, Ralphie, Jeff, Corey's second-in-command, accused as Ralph was poised to take a bite out of his sandwich. One of the other boys knocked the peanut butter and jelly out of Ralph's hands. Did what? Ralph asked, confused. You tried to kill Corey, Jeff answered. What? Don't play dumb. How? I don't know exactly, but we know it was you. Didn't someone break his second-story window and cover him with snow? Ralph asked. You had that ladder, Jeff reminded him. It's like three feet tall, Ralph countered. We're getting even with you, Ralphie. I'd sleep with one eye open if I was you. How do you sleep with one eye open? Ralph asked. Jeff struggled to find an answer to the question in his tiny little mind, and instead pointed a menacing finger at Ralph and said, You're dead. Some of the students with an earshot gasped. Ralph shrugged it off. He knew Corey's gang wasn't going to actually kill him. They might knock him to the ground, roll him around in the snow, kick his legs, but his life wasn't in any real danger. They were more annoying than anything. Still, did they actually believe Ralph had anything to do with whatever happened to Corey the night before? The notion was ridiculous. Then he remembered what he had noticed as he had raced out of the house that morning. Abe had been moved. Or had moved. Did the ventriloquist's cap work? Was it actually magic? The rest of the day dragged on, and when the last bell rang, Ralph ran to his locker, not bothering to even put his coat on as he sped out the back door of the school, through the teacher's parking lot, and down the street toward his house. When he arrived, he was panting so hard he thought he was going to pass out. Even with his coat tucked under his arm, he was feeling hot, and his breath formed great plumes of steam with every exhalation. He stood in front of Abe and studied him. It was more than him just having moved. His arms and legs were in different poses than he had sculpted, and his head, instead of looking across the street, was looking down at Ralph, its painted eyes studying him. Is it true? Ralph asked. Are you alive? Yes. Abe replied in a deep, gravelly voice. Pumpkin seeds sprayed out of his mouth as he hissed the last part of his answer. Holy cow! Ralph exclaimed. It worked! I can't believe it! Abe stared at him. He seemed to be breathing, his icy chest heaving at regular intervals. Then Ralph asked, Are you the one who tried to kill Cory Binger? You wanted me to get even with him. I meant for you to hit him in the face with a snowball or something, not break his window and bury him in snow. Sorry, Abe said, bowing his head. Ralph felt bad. He was the one who had wanted Abe to help him strike back at the bully. It wasn't his fault he overdid it. He was only a day old. That's okay, you didn't know any better, Ralph said. I didn't know, Abe echoed. Right, but now you do. I don't want you to really hurt anyone, okay? Okay. A snowball smacked Ralph in the back of his head. He turned to see Jeff and the rest of Corey's gang, along with additional reinforcements, heading in his direction, scooping up snow to compact and hurl Ralph's way. Ralph ducked behind Abe. Don't just stand there. Do something, he urged. Do what? I don't want to hurt anyone, Abe growled. Snowballs. Can you throw snowballs back at them? Yes, can throw snowballs. Abe bent over and scooped up a large chunk of snow. Then he reached into it with one of his arms, pulling out a perfectly round snowball, and fired it at the closest boy. It hit him square in the face. Another snowball flew, taking out the next boy, then another, and another. The oncoming formation started to break up. Some of the boys decided to flee before getting a face full of snow, but Jeff pushed on. He had half a dozen chunks of road ice cradled in his arm, hurling them at Ralph with all the fury he could muster. Abe blocked the projectiles. Each time he was hit by snow or ice, he absorbed it into his body, making himself bigger and apparently stronger. The other boys shouted at Jeff to back off, but Jeff didn't appear to hear them. 
Rage ruled him, and there was no way he was going to let Ralph get the better of him. Abe threw a snowball that hit Jeff right in the forehead. The bully stopped in his tracks, dazed. Another snowball, a huge one, the size of a cantaloupe, struck him in the chest and knocked him to the ground. Some of the other boys ran over to help him. Jeff regained his senses. He saw Ralph standing next to Abe. Bombardment of ice and snow ceased. Jeff slowly got to his feet. He turned around and saw the boys who had started to flee standing at a point they thought was out of range. Get back here, you cowards, he shouted. The other boys shared a look, then decided it was in their best interest to comply with the revenge-minded bully. Jeff glared at Ralph and Abe as his army, twenty strong at least, lined up on either side of him. There was an expression of rage on Jeff's face, made all the more intimidating by the growing and reddening lump in the middle of his forehead from Abe's snowball. Get him, Jeff ordered. He took a step forward. But before anyone else could move, Abe unleashed a volley of snowballs that was bigger and faster than Ralph thought possible. It was like he was a snowball machine gun. Most of the boys hit the deck. Some of the ones who had started to flee earlier tried to escape again. Only Jeff continued pushing forward as snowballs smashed into him. Suddenly, a van pulled up on the street separating Ralph from Jeff and his now reluctant arm. It was Mr. Smith's van, with the colorful circus lettering on the side. The driver's side window rolled down and a red-haired head poked out. Get in, he shouted as the side door slid open. It was grumpy. Mr. Smith's ventriloquist's dummy was driving the van. Hurry up, the clown urged. Abe, too? Ralph asked. Yes, especially Abe. Years of training from teachers and parents about getting into cars with strangers froze him in his tracks. But Grumpy wasn't technically a stranger, was he? Snowball started banging into the other side of the van. Get in! Grumpy repeated. Ralph climbed into the dark, windowless van. Come on, he said to Abe. Abe dropped his pile of snow and adroitly joined Ralph inside the van. Grumpy hit a control that caused the side door to start closing, but drove off before it had a chance to completely shut. Ralph grabbed onto a strap attached to the wall of the van and held on as a clown drove them away from Ralph's house. One last snowball, probably thrown by Jeff, smacked into the side of the van as they raced away. Where are we going? Ralph asked suddenly afraid that maybe putting his trust into a talking dummy was not the best choice he had made in his short life. We're just getting away from those crazy kids, Grumpy assured him. Curious, Ralph peeked into the front seat to see how Grumpy was managing to drive the van. His feet didn't reach the floor, but there was a set of levers that connected to the vehicle's pedals and a knob attached to the steering wheel that made it easier for Grumpy to turn it. They drove for about a mile and then pulled into the parking lot of the local grocery store. Grumpy turned off the engine. He jumped down off the booster on the driver's seat and looked at his passengers. So, you found Mr. Smith's cap, he said. Ralph suddenly realized that Mr. Smith wasn't sitting up front with Grumpy. He noticed the small clown staring past Ralph and Abe to something propped up in the back of the van. It was a mannequin, and it looked oddly like Mr. Smith. Then Ralph put it together. It wasn't Mr. Smith's hat. It was Grumpy's. Figuring it out, huh? Grumpy asked. He's the dummy, Ralph said. In a manner of speaking. How? Ralph asked. That's a big question, Grumpy replied. The truth is, I don't really know. The clown grabbed an upside-down milk crate and sat down. It all started when I was in high school. As you can tell, if being a redhead wasn't enough of a reason for the other kids to tease me, I'm a little challenged in the height department, too. I decided early on that I wasn't going to let it stop me from being successful. I wanted to be a comedian, but ironically, no one took me seriously. I was about to give up when one day I was walking through the park when a big gust of wind blew this cap, he pointed at the flat cap perched atop Abe's pumpkin head, off the head of a man sitting on a park bench. I ran over to catch it and carried it back to him, but when I got there, it wasn't a man. It was a statue that was posed on the bench. I'd been through that park many times, and I'd never noticed it before, but it didn't look new. I didn't see anyone else around, so I shoved it in my pocket and didn't think about it until later when I was walking through a department store. Someone called out to me that I had dropped my hat. I turned around and saw the cap on the ground. I don't know why, but I had the urge to just toss it at the nearest mannequin. When I did so, it landed perfectly atop his plastic head like it was drawn there by magnets. That's like what happened with me, Ralph said. Grumpy nodded, admiring the way the flat cap perched atop the snowman's pumpkin head. 
I decided to just leave it there and walk down to the store. A little while later, I had the feeling someone was following me. I turned around, and there was Mr. Smith. I didn't realize that he was the mannequin right away, but once I put it all together, I had my great idea. Mr. Smith and Grumpy, Ralph said. Grumpy smiled. Mr. Smith and Grumpy. I started getting booked in comedy clubs, and I've been doing parties and things like school assemblies. I sent the tape in America's Got Talent. Keep your fingers crossed for me. Ralph nodded and showed that he had the fingers of both hands crossed. I'm guessing just as the hat found me when I needed it, it found you when you did. When I heard on the news that that boy had been attacked by some mysterious invader, it reminded me of some of Mr. Smith's early efforts to defend me. I was driving back to the school when I saw the cap on your whatever that is. His name is Abe. After Abraham Van Brunt? Grumpy asked. Exactly, the headless horseman. Most people think it was Ichabod Crane. Right, but I actually read the story. Me too! The boy and the clown smiled at each other. Listen, I know you made a new friend, Grumpy said, nodding at Abe. But do you think now that every kid in town thinks you have a killer snowman, Mr. Smith might have his cat back? Ralph's smile fell away. He looked over at Abe. He barely had a chance to know him, and now Grumpy was asking him to essentially say goodbye forever. Abe looked at Ralph and smiled. It's okay, he said in his deep, rumbling voice. Did I help? Was I a good friend? Yes, Ralph replied. You were the best. He threw his arms around Abe's icy chest and hugged him, pressing his cheek against the snow until it started to hurt from the cold. Abe patted him gently on the back. Say goodbye, Abe, Grumpy said. Abe turned to Ralph. Goodbye, Abe. Ralph smiled. Grumpy walked over to the pumpkin-headed snowman and carefully lifted the flap cap off his head. It came away easily, and the life drained away from Abe as he collapsed into a pile of snow, with the pumpkin resting atop it askew. Then the cap flew out of Grumpy's hands and atop the mannequin. Mr. Smith blinked his eyes and looked at Grumpy and Ralph with a smile. Hello, Grumpy. Hello, Ralph. Hey, how come he knows my name? Ralph asked. Grumpy shrugged. Mr. Smith glanced over at the pile of snow that was once Abe. Whatever he was is now part of me, he explained. Then he looked at Ralph and asked, We can still be friends, can't we? Ralph nodded and gave Mr. Smith a hug, one that was considerably warmer than the one he had shared with Abe. Sorry to cut this short, Grumpy said, but we're going to be late for our next gig if we don't hit the road now. Do you mind walking home from here? Sure, that's fine, Ralph said. Grumpy reached over and hit the button that caused the van door to slide open. Ralph jumped out. Wait, Grumpy said. I have something for you. The clown climbed back up into the front seat, opened the glove compartment, and pulled something out and wrote on it with a stinky marker. He turned around and presented Ralph with an autographed photo of the mannequin and himself. The message read, For our friend Ralph, all the very best, Mr. Smith and Grumpy. And below that, he drew a snowman with a pumpkin for a head. Thanks for joining us. If you're listening on a podcast app, please hit the subscribe button to be notified when we release future episodes. For more information about the podcast and the authors, visit asreadbyme.com. If you're a writer and would like to read something on an upcoming episode, send an email to writers at asreadbyme.com.